So to shed light on this topic, we have with us today three of the most knowledgeable experts in the field. Going alphabetically, we first have Itamar Ben Zakin. And Itamar, if I'm saying your last name wrong, please tell me. Um, Itamar is an investigative reporter at The Seventh Eye, an independent magazine that covers the media sphere. One of the projects he spearheaded was uncovering the activities and money trail of Israel's, Israel's Ministry of Strategic Affairs and its affiliated NGOs. Second, we have Noah Landau. Noah is a journalist at Haaretz, uh, where she covers Israel's foreign relations, and she's a member of Haaretz's editorial board. Prior to that, she served as head of the news department and editor of Haaretz's English edition, and she has written extensively about the Ministry of Strategic Affairs and its activities. And last, we have Or Saden. Or is a lawyer with the Movement of Free for Freedom of Information, an Israeli NGO that works to establish governmental transparency, including vis-a-vis -vis government policies and funding in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. The Movement for Freedom of Information of Israel, MFOI it's called, works to gain access to and publish official documentation that becomes the basis for reports and lawsuits, which in turn fuel media focus, international scrutiny and activism, and work that has been critical to shining a light on the activities of the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, which is famously uh, secretive about what it's doing. Uh, so about today's webinar, as is our regular practice, if you attend our webinars, you know that the format for today's webinar will be a discussion between the panelists and myself. In addition to my questions, we are eager to take audience questions, which can be submitted via the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom window. Feel free to submit questions at any time throughout the panel. I'll be keeping an eye on the Q&A box and will do my best to factor in as many of them as I can. Also, please note this webinar is being recorded. Obviously, it's on the record and it will be posted online immediately after it ends. If you have any technical problems with the webinar, let us know using the chat function, which is also at the bottom of your Zoom window. Uh, don't use the chat function for questions because I probably won't see them. Uh, and finally, do keep an eye on the chat function because my colleague Sarah Ann Minkin is using it and she will be posting links to a lot of the articles uh, we'll be discussing today, as well as to related materials on the topic that people may find useful. So uh, we're gonna get started. Uh, and I want to start with Itzimar. Itzimar, you have been investigating and writing about the Ministry of Strategic Affairs for years. Can you give our audience just some basic background about what this is? What is the Ministry of Strategic Affairs? When was it founded? What is its mission? And also, can you talk a little bit about Kela Shlomo, which is the program within the ministry that is the focus uh, of a lot of our conversation today? Okay, yes, uh, but please, before uh, everything, please pardon my English. It's a, it's a bit uh, crooked, so I made some uh, notes. Let's hope everything will go uh, smoothly. Um, I've been investigating the Ministry of uh, Strategic Affairs for about four years. Uh, the beginning goes like this. Uh, I read uh, a report, a really dull report, by the Israeli state uh, controller that uh, talked that examined the failures of the whole Hasbara uh, branch of the government. And uh, I noticed that nobody knows anything about this uh, entire ministry that supposedly is in charge of flooding the globe uh, with propaganda. Uh, back then, uh, nobody knew the MSA four years ago uh, because it was a really small office that didn't do anything, almost anything. Uh, but uh, so what we did with the seventh eye is that we filed a freedom of information uh, request, a really basic freedom of information request that uh, most ministries will uh, give the information gladly and without any problems. Um, the response that we got was a big no. The ministry that was put in charge of uh, Hasbara claimed that it cannot expose anything because, uh, about itself because it would damage Israel's foreign relations and in some cases, cases even uh, put uh, the national security in danger. Uh, for us as journalists, that was uh, very inspiring and of course that we decided to uh, dig deeper. Now about the, the office in general, the ministry in general, 
uh, it wasn't always uh, dealing with the uh, delegitimization of the state of Israel. It has it had uh, some years in which it dealt with Iran or the Jewish diaspora, and uh, but the big turn came in uh, mid-2015, uh, and then also the, the big money started uh, coming. Uh, when Minister uh, Gilad Erdan was put in charge and uh, Netanyahu's government decided to, uh, to start allocate uh, larger and larger budgets for, for this uh, mission of confronting the delegitimization or uh, what they call sometimes uh, the BDS uh, threat. Um, oh, so, this uh, the term delegitimization is really opaque. You could you could uh, include their uh, vicious anti-Semitism as well as the standard criticism about the uh, acts of the government. For example, the fight they fight uh, to expose NGOs with financial ties with uh, Islamic terror, which is great in my opinion, uh, but they also. Uh, claim that opposing the occupation in non-violent ways like branding, uh, branding, uh, how do you say, wow. <laughs> the branding products is a step no, towards, no, help us with no I know, <laughs> pr products, branding products is a, a step towards eradicating uh, Israel. Labeling, labeling, labeling. You mean the labeling? Yes, labeling, uh, let's say, products from the West Bank is, uh, is eradicating Israel as we know it, which is, of course, uh, total bullshit. As for uh, Kela Shlomo, today uh, it has a generic, non-Google friendly name, a uh, concert, but I still enjoy calling it uh, Kela Shlomo, Solomon's Sling. Uh, Kela Shlomo is a Gongo government uh, organized NGO that was founded in coordination with the Israeli government in order to build a buffer zone between the state and the state sponsored propaganda. Whoop. On the paper, it's an NGO, uh, but most of its resources come from the government as well as its missions. Uh, and it was founded by uh, government has-beens and cronies, and the MSA staff are uh, an, interg an integral part of its mechanism, but it, it does not uh, operate inside the ministry. That's it. Great. As is typical in every webinar, at least once, I forget to unmute myself. So hopefully that was the time and that will be it. So I want to turn to Noah. So. Picking up on where Tima left off, so since it was founded, as I said, and, and as it's in my reference, the, the Ministry of Strategic Affairs has been notoriously non-transparent. Can you talk about this? What has it been like reporting on the ministry compared to other parts of the Israeli government, for example? Yes. Hi, everyone. First of all, thank you for having me. Um, and thank you, Itamar. Uh, I really want to say that uh, Itamar is really the number one expert uh, in my view. Uh, although, you know, we write on the same things, but uh, there's really no comparison. I think what Itamar did uh, in this field is, uh, is pretty amazing. Um, and um, first of all, I would like to start and say that uh, the Ministry of Strategic Affairs is a made up ministry um, that came about because of political reasons. Uh, they needed, in the beginning, like Itamar mentioned, um, it was a ministry that dealt with um, Iranian issues. And then uh, it was all about uh, propaganda. And then, you know, the whole fight against BDS kind of started in 2015 uh, with an official uh, um, government decision uh, led by a uh, because every time the, the ministry kind of changed its purpose uh, with the political uh, problem they wanted to solve. Uh, they just gave this ministry to, you know, whoever politician they needed to satisfy at the, uh, you know, the specific given time. And um, Gilad Erdan was also uh, in charge of, um, uh, he, he was also a ministry of police uh, at the time. So it wasn't really its, his main 
uh, we'll, we'll talk maybe later a little, a little bit more about Gilad Erdan, but it, it wasn't his main project. Uh, it was something that um, he was giving uh, a, 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 as a political gift to kind of like emphasize uh, his uh, role or influence inside the government. So to begin with, uh, this whole project was born, you know, out of sin because uh, it, it, was, it wasn't really something that the Israeli government needed strategically. Uh, it wasn't, uh, it's funny that, you know, they call them the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, which, which is totally vague and doesn't mean anything. Uh, I always call it, uh, they're, they're very upset when I call it the Ministry of Affairs <laughs> because, uh, you know, it sounds ridiculous, but it is ridiculous. So it all started uh, without, you know, real purpose. And then they kind of, uh, they were looking for a purpose for a long time until, uh, again, as Itamal said, uh, they found one in 2015, which, which is the fight that didn't did, did get the, the uh, yes, and also uh, the, um, the fight against BBS. And um, I think that this discussion is, is getting interesting and also a little, a little bit problematic, maybe at this specific point, because everything we're going to talk about uh, in this webinar belongs to a different minister uh, under a different hat in a different period, which I'm not sure is going to be the same now that Kahol uh, took the ministry uh, to its responsibility. So since Gilad Erdan left, he's now, uh, congratulations, he's now uh, the ambassador to the US and the UN. So uh, you'll hear about them more, Lara. Uh, but um, since he left, I'm not sure that this flag will now be the same one. Because as I mentioned, this ministry went through so many processes, um, it could kind of change its purpose again. Uh, it is a government decision uh, to uh, fight BDS, uh, uh, et cetera, a, a, as a main purpose, but um, it can be understood in many different ways and uh, it can be, uh, you know, implemented in different ways. So just, this is just, you know, uh, I don't know, a warning or a remark that everything we're talking about is not necessarily um, true to uh, these specific days. Um, and we still don't know exactly to what extent. Because uh, it could also just be uh, the same under um, maybe uh, a, a different marketing package uh, that could also be true. Uh, because the, the, the director of uh, the ministry at the moment uh, used to be the IDF spokesperson. So they're expert in repackaging and, uh, you know, marketing uh, things in a different ways. And uh, regarding transparency, I think you'll talk about that with all now. And this is definitely his uh, field of expertise, but I can say that as a journalist, um, the, this ministry was definitely uh, the most problematic uh, of all, again, uh, mostly uh, during uh, Erdan's period, because they specifically wanted uh, to exclude themselves from the Freedom of Information Act. Um, I mean, they actively uh, requested to be excluded uh, for all the reasons that they all mentioned, such as uh, risks to national, national security and so on. Although you have to remember that in Israel, this excuse, you know, you, you'll hear it quite a lot because uh, and this, the, the scope of the law usually uh, mentions this is, is, is one of the legitimate reasons um, to uh, be excluded from freedom of information. So it doesn't mean that, it, that you know, they just need to um, kind of make the reasons uh, adaptable to the uh, to the request. It doesn't mean that it, it, they really, sometimes it sounds, you know, uh, be, better than it really is. It's not that they really deal with international security. It's that that's what they need to say to be excluded from the act. So um, I think that they were uh, probably the most uh, problematic ministry uh, of all, uh, hiding information and, and so on. But there are other ministries. I mean, um, uh, I was just uh, talking today to some of old colleagues about the Prime Minister office. It's not that rare in the Israeli landscape to see uh, ministries, you know, avoiding freedom of information requests and hiding all sorts of 
uh, uh, public data. Um, it happens elsewhere as well, but they made it kind of their flag uh, a few years ago that they um, specifically want to be excluded. They didn't. In the end, uh, it didn't work, and maybe all can uh, shed more light about their fight uh, around it, uh, but it didn't work. And we are seeing a little bit more cooperation recently, again, since Kaholavan uh, took control of the ministry. We have been seeing a little bit more uh, cooperation. We'll talk about one of the reports that has been revealed this way uh, uh, recently, but um, it is also kind of too soon to say if it will be uh, the trend or this is just something that they're doing now so that you know, they'll look better um, uh, to, to the press, you know, when, when they're just beginning now, um, they're, uh, they're trying to open like a new page uh, regarding the uh, PR for the ministry. Terrific, thank you. And that's a really important framing for us to remember for the audience that, you know, when we're talking about freedom of information, we're talking always, this is backward looking. We'll also talk a little bit later in the webinar, sort of forward-looking speculative. I also, just listening to you now, I'm reminded, um, I remember in the, around 2015 when the word delegitimization suddenly appeared everywhere. And it wasn't, I'm not even sure it was in the, the English dictionary. We started using it and trying to figure out what exactly it meant. And it, it became this term of art, which is now you know, ever-present and, and means um, everything. Uh, so thank you. So turning to Orr and, and picking up now on, on where Noah has left us, talk to us about the situation in Israel in general when it comes to freedom of information. This is what you do and how things are different or not different with respect to the Ministry of Strategic Affairs. Yes. Hi, everyone. Thank you, uh, Lara, for inviting us here today. It's really important for us and I guess it is important uh, to whoever uh, joined us today. Uh, I will continue what Noah said about Itamar, and I will say it as well uh, about uh, Noah and Itamar together that they mediate the information to the public, which is really, really important these days in order to understand more about uh, what is happening uh, in the Ministry of Strategic Affairs. And uh, of course, uh, we'll speak about it also today, but I think in order to understand more the situation in Israel regarding freedom of information and the right for information, I will tell a small story uh, that will demonstrate it. And it's regarding uh, who, who was uh, the, just, the Ministry of Justice in 1998 when uh, uh, the law uh, passed, was legislated in Israel. Back then, Tzachi Hanegbi uh, actually stood on the Knesset and said, uh, that in order to fulfill, to fulfill the purpose of the Israeli law, of the uh, information, uh, freedom of information law, uh, the public, ser public servants had to change their minds and to understand that the information belonged to the public. Uh, these days we're 22 years later and uh, he's now the ministry of uh, the settlement ministry, the minister of the settlement ministry, and we're trying to understand who is responsible for freedom of information law in that office for about five months. And we can't understand where to go or whoever to speak with in order to get information from them. So it's a short story that somehow uh, you can understand more about it. Uh, it's the most, most puffed uh, government uh, in Israel now, 38 or 36 uh, ministry, ministries and some new ministries as this one, and uh, we just can't really get information from there. Um, at the same time, um, there is a change, of course, during this late, the last 22 years, especially in the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, the Movement for Freedom of Information was established back in 2004, and back then, uh, in order to file a request, we had to pay uh, they had to pay, I wasn't there yet, of course, uh, they had to pay uh, 30 US dollars, which is the most expensive or highest rate in the world for a, a request. And uh, once you have fired a request to a ministry, they couldn't understand what you want from them. They didn't know that they have to answer. These days, today is free for NGOs, uh, not for journal journalists, unfortunately. 
uh, but yet it's not important, it's not uh, expensive as before, sorry. Uh, but we do feel in the last few years that there is a regression uh, and the situation is not good enough and the change that has to be happening in the public servant minds haven't made or it's not there yet, that's for sure. As Noah mentioned as well, uh, one of the most uh, absurd is that the Prime Minister office violate the law every morning, uh, more or less. They don't get information, they don't answer uh, requests, and it's really hard to communicate with them, which also explains a bit about what the government thinks regarding uh, the freedom of information law. Um, and also, I think at the time of the corona, uh, we can understand it one more time because we do get information uh, from the Ministry of Health. Uh, they publish information regarding the situation, but, but not everything. And not only not everything, one of the cases that we tried to, uh, we went to court thanks to Noah, uh, Noah uh, that tried to get the protocols from the Corona cabinet, uh, corona cabinet uh, talks. Um, and then the, they said that they're not willing to let us read the, those protocols or almost anything. We don't really know what was there and what are the background uh, documents that, uh, uh, that they read before uh, those, uh, I forgot the word, sessions, sessions. sessions or uh, meetings. And uh, it also explains us a bit more why they don't really into uh, freedom of information and into uh, transparency. Regarding uh, the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, uh, I think Noah and Itamar spoke about it. And at first they thought they're both uh, the Shin Bet and the Mossad together, somehow a good mixture of both of them. And uh, it was pretty hard at the beginning. Um, at most of the time they just argued that they're about to exclude themselves and therefore they're not answering for requests. Later on they started to answer, but only just a bit. And it was a, a kind of a catch-22 for us because we knew that if we will go to court because of such a refusal for a request, they will say to, to the court, uh, this is our issue. We are going to exclude ourselves, so don't let them anything. And I guess that the court will say the same thing because the courts let the government do whatever, not whatever they want, but almost everything they want, especially if, the, a law is going to be changed on their behalf. And um, that's why the beginning of, uh, I guess it was around four years ago, five years ago, I guess four years ago, uh, it was really hard to work with them. Uh, I do remember one time that I, uh, I was in a committee a meeting of uh, the transparency committee that ran by, led by uh, Stav Shapir. Uh, she was a Knesset member from uh, the Labour Party. And I've tried to ask them whether we will be able to understand how they fight against BDS and if, and if they find it differently to fight BDS on uh, the, the, the West Bank uh, or inside Israel, if there is any different, if they think that there is different or, or where they put their efforts in inside the 67th border, outside. And she just said, uh, Sima Vaknin, I think, she said, you won't be able to know that. And it's, of course, absurd for me. And it's, of course, the right of the Israeli citizens to know and to learn more about uh, those things. And of course, the change came. I believe I will continue later about the situation, that how the situation had changed during the years, if it's OK, of course. Yeah, no, that, that's great. Um, so, so sticking with you for a second, we're having this webinar today because there was something of a breakthrough, right? So your organization filed a freedom of information request, which actually succeeded in getting information out of the ministry. So can you talk about this a little bit? How did, and how did the formation, I mean, Noah referenced this, how did the formation of a new government and someone new taking over the ministry affect that, the situation that we could be here having this conversation today? Um, so I think the change came in two different, for two different reasons. First of all, um, together with, I think, with journalists as Noah and Itamar uh, that spoke about, that wrote about this office and the fact that they're trying to be not transparent at all, uh, and together with other NGOs, as well as the Stav Shapir's committee that uh, 
uh, I must admit that uh, it helped a lot. The fact that she dealt with this office uh, for several times, several meetings. Um, at the end, they have uh, Gilad Erdan in one of those committees, in one of those meetings, sorry. He said that there's, they're about to stop trying to uh, exclude themselves from, from uh, the law. But at the same time, the first argument that we gave was the fact that the law itself, the Israeli law itself, uh, has uh, exemptions. So, of course, they can say that they won't reveal information because of the fact that it will harm our foreign affairs, their uh, methods, and etc., and etc. I do believe that the big change happened uh, thanks to the last elections. Uh, it's hard for me to say thanks for the last elections, but uh, uh, in this uh, area, thanks to, this, uh, to the last elections and the fact that the uh, Kaholavan Blue and White Party uh, got this ministry. And somehow uh, the director of the office, as well as the new minister, um, understood, I think they understood that it will be better for them somehow. Uh, in some uh, um, in some community, it's not communities, but like in the U.S. and in Israel, in several uh, uh, groups of people, um, I think uh, we got tired, and people got tired from this office and the fact that they tried to be uh, the Shin Bet or the Mossad, and uh, I believe that they did understood that it, it would be better for them. Uh, to give more information to the public. And uh, it they will gain popularity. They will be more popular uh, thanks to this, to that. So I think uh, the big change that came in the last election when they got inside. And uh, it was pretty early that, at the time that uh, they got into the office that we understood that there is someone to talk with over there, that they really was willing to speak with us they actually, I think they, in one of the conversation, they said that they're willing to give more informa information than before, uh, which was really important for us. It's also, it's kind of funny because we're speaking about five years, but I think in that five years, we're around three years in elections or something like elections or uh, unstable uh, government and etc. as for today, of course, uh, it's never stable in our area. Um, but I think in that time we understood that we can ask for the same information we asked several times before uh, for the protocols of Kela Shlomo concert, uh, concert sorry, and to understand more about the, their efforts. And uh, we understood that they're going to answer us and then we got the information that was really important for us. Uh, and I think both uh, Noah and Itama will agree that it was important for them as well. Firstly, we could understand more about the, their efforts. And I do believe that they have understood it as well, that it will be good for them to learn more about themselves, to understand what people thinks about, think about it, and etc. cetera. And um, that's it for now. Terrific. Um, so picking up on that, Itamar, if you could come back into the screen. I, lo I love having webinar participants in the same room. This is, this is so much fun. So Itzimar, you broke the story about these documents that were, that were pulled out of the, uh, the ministry by Or and his colleagues. And you published in-depth analysis on this in Hebrew. I think my colleague is gonna put a link into the, the chat box um, about what they contain. Could you very briefly, we'll get into more detail later. Can you sketch out for the audience what these documents were and, and what they show, why they're important? Sure. Uh, these documents uh, that, as you, say, as you said, were acquired by OR in cooperation with the 7th I, uh, are the protocols of Kela Shlomo's uh, steering committee where, where uh, government officials sit alongside the uh, Kela Shlomo uh, personnel. They mainly deal with the financials. What's the status of the money that they try to raise, mainly in the US, and uh, what's the status with the money that they want to get from our government? The basic idea behind the financials of uh, Kela Shlomo is matching every dollar or shekel that they get from an outside uh, organization or a tycoon, they would get another shekel or dollar from the government. Uh, so on paper, they could have had a really huge budget of $70 mil million, which is a lot in Israel. Uh, what's 
so dramatic about these documents, in my opinion, uh, is that they show how Kela Shlomo failed to raise the, this money and got to a point of an actual uh, financial crisis, even before doing anything uh, significant. significant. Uh, they speak uh, in these meetings openly about American entities that don't want to participate uh, in this effort of the Ministry of Strategic Affairs because uh, they fear of becoming uh, foreign agents. Uh, and in the end, uh, when you go to the last meeting or maybe the one before the last, you, even, you can even see uh, Kela Shlomo's representatives uh, start a verbal quarrel with the people of the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, uh, telling them that they, uh, that they are responsible for, the, for this uh, colossal uh, flop uh, and that they will ruin everything. And that's really, you can, you can imagine uh, somebody putting it into a film. Uh, I think that in an alternate uh, reality in which we don't expose uh, Kela Shlomo right in its in inception, we exposed their inception in uh, late 2017, uh, this crisis wouldn't have happened and they would have uh, a really more easy way of uh, getting this money from, uh, from these mysterious American tycoons that they uh, targeted. Let me ask you, we're going to go to Noah in a second. One more thing. You, you talk about this as a failure. How much money, according to the protocols, how much money was spent um, on these activities before the failure or even with the failure? I don't remember the, the, the exact amount, although we reported it. I think it's around... It was 13, 13, 13 million uh, from the 128 Shekos. that they were promised, Shekels. Shekels, 13, which means 26 or something like that. Yeah. Yes. So, so it's, it's really, still, it's so fact, still a significant uh, amount of money. So failure yeah, is a relative yeah. term. Um, almost nothing uh, in comparison to $70 million. Yeah. Um, so thank you. So Noah, you also did a deep dive on these documents um, in English, which is good for our audience. We're going to put up, I think, the links to both articles. So can you talk about your main conclusions, which I know paralleled to Mars, but different set of eyes. What, what were your main conclusions um, reading the, these protocols? So first of all, I'm not sure what is the background of most of our listeners now um, on this issue. So maybe just for those who are not, you know, experts uh, of this, maybe we'll take just a step back and say that um, the reason for all this, uh, you know, mysteriousness and uh, all these battles we had around freedom of information, uh, because I'm not sure we mentioned it, is that um, the ministry's main activity, they don't really do anything themselves. They mostly pay other organizations to do uh, whatever they need to do to fight BDS, etc. So uh, the whole issue around um, the, the question of giving or not revealing information and so on, maybe it's important to say that it, it's happening because um, they claim that uh, if, they, if they will expose the whole list of organizations that they fund, and again, that's almost the only thing that they do, they fund organizations um, to fight uh, BDS and now more towards uh, hate speech online uh, and so on. That's what the new uh, minister, Orit Falkash, is trying to do, to take it more to the direction of combating uh, um, BDS and hate speech and so on uh, online. Um, all, all these organizations that they found, they claim that if it would be, if the whole list would be published, then they couldn't do their, their job. Because some of the organizations, they don't want to be perceived as uh, lobbying for Israel for various reasons and some legal ones that we'll soon uh, uh, talk about. But uh, let's talk about now not the legal issue, and I see that some of the viewers are already asking about the foreign acts, etc. But, but um, first of all, it's the, uh, it's the question of appearance more than the legal one, because some organizations don't want to be viewed as um, puppets of a government, what we know as gongos, government NGOs. They want to be perceived as independent. Um, so that was the main reason that the ministry always insisted that they don't want to reveal to the Israeli public where their, the money of the Israeli public is going to, because that will harm the cooperation uh, between the ministry, ministry and these organizations. 
Can so, I just add, uh, I mean, can, can you just mention or address the, there's something ironic in what you've just said, because that goes in parallel with the Israeli government's um, urgent efforts to force every Israeli NGO that accepts a dollar of foreign funding, if they're on the progressive side, to effectively declare themselves as foreign agents. I mean, these things are happening in parallel in Israel. Can you just address that as well? Definitely. I mean, um, we do see in Israel more and more pressure um, that is, you know, being inspired by uh, events in other countries, such as Russia, for example, um, to have total transparency about any foreign funding uh, whatsoever. And uh, of course, uh, at the foreign same government, time, foreign government funding, not foreign private individual funding, only government funding. Well, the, the law speaks about foreign government funding, but there's a, a whole campaign and pressure um, about foreign funding uh, in general, uh, for example, against George Soros. Um, so it's something that's not, I mean, in terms of the law, you're definitely right. It focuses on uh, government uh, funding in terms of foreign funding, but there's also a whole campaign about just, you know, foreign money. Um, and uh, to that extent, I mean, the, 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 it is, I mean, you're totally right. It is uh, ironic or, you know, more than that, that um, uh, this is happening in Israel and outside Israel. Um, they, they don't want to reveal uh, government funding to our organizations. Again, claiming that they were saying that it's the organizations themselves that um, do not wish to uh, reveal uh, these connections. Now, um, because, of, because of all of this, um, those documents were important because um, till this day, even with the documents we obtained, we don't really have the full complete list of these are the X, Y number of organizations that the ministry funds to do this and that. You know, that's the basic, that, that's the most, that, that's the basic way that uh, almost every, um, again, civilian uh, ministry in Israel operates. Uh, like Itamal said, maybe they want to, uh, have some kind of a fantasy that they are, uh, you know, the uh, Mossad or uh, some kind of a, a, a international security organization. That's not the case. They're not. It's a, it's a civil operation. So uh, we do not until this day, even with those documents, have the complete, full, transparent list of all the organizations that were funded. More than that, the documents that we actually obtained uh, were also censored. So it is important to know that the documents that we got were not 100% transparent. We had to uh, kind of complete some of the information on our own, some of that we couldn't. Uh, so part of it was censored. But the bottom line, I mean, um, you know, you asked me if uh, what, uh, what was, uh, you know, the main conclusion. I think that if I look at the bigger picture of this whole, um, document that what we found out is that in the end the secrets are not that impressive interesting dramatic or dark the things that they try to hide are trivial i mean some of the organizations that uh we discovered are you know are even ridiculous i mean some of them were uh preparing israelis to travel abroad with the message uh, of the israeli government you know, to uh, collect just backpackers, backpackers who wanted to go and travel, uh, you know, in South America, uh, teach them, you know, give them some propaganda tools to spread around while they're on their big trip abroad. So uh, that's, that's not something that, uh, you know, needs to be hidden. That's not something, you know, um, that, that, sound, that, that is supposed to sound problematic to anyone. And it's definitely something that the Israeli public should be aware, you know, that his money is being spent on these uh, projects. Uh, whether it's important or not, you know, it's, it's also for the public to judge. And some of them that were uh, censored uh, were more political. Uh, so for example, um, groups of soldiers who uh, speak, uh, you know, on behalf of the Israeli government, uh, those kind of groups that are considered more political in Israel, they were censored uh, from the document because of the political controversy uh, uh, that, of course, you know, is, is part of it. But that also, in the end, 
shows you that um, those, you know, it, we saw this also with other um, so-called secret documents that were exposed worldwide. Usually the deepest secrets, the darkest secrets are not such a secret and they wouldn't really surprise anyone. So my main conclusion from these documents was that there is definitely no need for this secrecy and um, that we are still waiting to see the full list to judge, you know, if it's really the case. Thank you. Uh, I just, just in the, in, I don't know if you have anything you want to add. I, when the story broke in the U.S. media, um, Aidan Pink from The Forward, who's now moved on, uh, he's left journalism, um, he's not with us today, but he wrote several articles and he pulled out things that I think were the most sort of shocking for Americans, which wasn't the story of the failure of Kailash Lomo or that some of these groups are trivial. It was, you know, one was headlined, U.S. pro-Israel groups failed to disclose grants from the Israeli government. And another one was Israel approved grant to Tennessee anti-Muslim hate group. Hate group is um, in quotes. And the third one was think tank. Um, and this is a think tank that actually uh, tracks anti-Semitism and gives policy advice on anti-Semitism. Think tank failed to disclose six figure grant from Israeli government. And all of these are actually pretty, these are not, these are pretty big stories from the idea of Americans who are concerned that, that there's um, intervention going on in our domestic policy process. Um, is there anything in the document um, that was specifically shocking to you, the documents when you went through them, Noah? And Itamar, get ready, because I'm going to ask you the same question next. So again, uh, I, I, I wasn't shocked. Uh, I mean, I think it was pretty much exactly what we expected uh, to see that, you know, has been um, funded. But um, I do think that um, from parts of the documents that were censored, as I mentioned, and you could see that there was a mysterious uh, discussion uh, within the framework, again, of, the, of Kela Shlomo. Um, but I'm sure, you know, that was um, a major discussion in the ministry as well about the question of uh, identifying themselves as foreign agents according to the American, according to US law. So you could see, again, but not um, the full picture of it um, and not the conclusions, um, not the bottom line of what actually happened uh, in those discussions about uh, the Foreign Act. I think that what we do know is um, First of all, that you know th this discussion was important and intensive and took place. Second, that they paid American lawyers uh, to uh, discuss to, for advice uh, on this issue. Uh, I'm not sure we can say um, you know um, that they somehow you know we can't say for a hundred percent that um, it was. Um, manipulated uh, knowingly or anything like that. I mean, from what we see from the documents, um, the amount of discussions and money that went to lawyers probably indicates that it wasn't the boundaries of law somehow or that they tried, you know, to do it as such. Um, but you can definitely say that um, it was uh, an issue of concern let's say, uh, this way. And this, I'm sure, is very interesting for, uh, for Americans, yes, to know if you know someone. I mean, the, it's very um, clear that organizations that are lobbying on behalf of a foreign government should declare themselves as such. Um, so I'm sure you know that uh, all the great work that has been done in the Ford, et cetera, has, has you know, interests uh, to Americans. I can't say that I think it's unfortunate. Maybe, I mean, if there's a, uh, a journalist out there uh, um, who's trying to cover this for uh, the American media, you know, since really the Ford hasn't been dealing with this, I think we do lack someone maybe um, on the American front who could uh, dive a little bit deeper into that aspect. I'm not sure, I mean, we try with, uh, Paul's help, uh, et cetera, um, um, with Israeli journalists try to, you know, bring all the information from the Israeli side. Um, I do think that maybe uh, there needs to be some more 
uh, diving in on the American side of the story. Yeah, you know, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, I would just make the point as someone who follows this closely, without information on the Israeli side, it's very hard to tell. So we find ourselves here piecing things together. So for example, there is a lawyer who is engaged in, in uh, energetic lawfare um, on behalf of Israel. He, he says that, who became, who started working very closely with the International Legal Forum, which is an NGO in Israel that is um, working as a contractor for the ministry. And it was only after a while that he actually registered under FARA, and then he had to, he, then he revised his registration under FARA to note that this is an organization that is affiliated with the Israeli government. But this is um, International Legal Forum is engaged in legal action around the country in various areas. And it's, it's very opaque. Um, I was actually really hoping there'd be something in, this, in these documents that talked about that. The same thing with Gilad Ardan and his contacts with governors around the country um, on BDS related legislation. It's very opaque um, what the actual engagement is. I, I would yeah, I hope someone also looks at that. Lara, yeah, I mean, me too, and we try, but also, Lara, you know, it's also very difficult to differentiate between um, that. So let's say uh, the ministry gives uh, funding for a specific organization for a specific project or a specific person for a specific project. How do you differentiate between, you know, the specific project that the money was allocated to and, you know, everything else that that person or organization does? So, you know, as always with budgets, it's pretty tricky, but uh, I do think that the best answer would just be to keep fighting, you know, to have the whole full list. Um, to just know, you know, once and for all, with full transparency, you know, where exactly all the money goes, to who, what they do, and then, you know, it's the easiest way to just challenge it and have, have a discussion, but it didn't happen yet. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, Itamar, same question. You dug deep into these documents. Was there anything in there that was particularly surprising or shocking to you? Or was it just confirming things that you were already pretty certain of and were just waiting for confirmation? It wasn't shocking. We knew that the Ministry of Strategic Affairs is uh, funding activities abroad, made mainly in the U.S., and that uh, Kela Shlomo was part of it. We even made a paparazzi session of the former uh, director of the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, Sima Vaknin Gil, we, who, who was also our former military censor, uh, talking business with uh, some American money guy in a Tel Aviv uh, luxury hotel. Uh, and we also knew that they were failing. We had some indications uh, from within the office and from, from some other documents that we acquired in other ways, not through the ministry. What did surprise me was uh, that the ministry, or should I say the new regime in the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, the new, uh, the new minister, uh, agreed to give us uh, these documents uh, because they portray uh, really, uh, it's not between the lines, it's written black on white uh, uh, that uh, every, anybody can read them and see that they portray a colossal fail. Uh, and the people at the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, the, the people that work there right now, uh, I'm 100% sure that they knew that in the minute that they give away this kind of uh, of information, it will be another nail in the coffin of the biggest project of their predecessor, Gilad Erdan. So when I when I see that somebody gives me this kind of a of a bomb, uh, I start to wonder why, because uh, they they didn't have to give us uh, this these protocols, um, and I still wonder. I didn't get an, a straight answer yet. You're a journalist, you ask more questions. Every bit of information brings more questions. Thank you, we appreciate that. <laughs> um, or, let's just moving the camera back over to you. So again, following up on those last two answers, I wanna ask you, how complete a picture of the past years, let's just focus on the Erdan years, obviously, do you think we have from the documents that, that you, we've got so far? And again, I noticed you know, there are things that I was looking for that weren't addressed, but again, that may just be outside of the scope of what can be FOIA'd. So what, did, what do you think? So first- Are there more think, secrets to come? Um, yeah, of course. For the fact that I'm not a journalist, I do think that uh, Noah and Ditama will agree that uh, the picture is never complete. 
Uh, Noah already mentioned that uh, some of the protocols was censored, and I'm sure that there are, is more information that we don't know yet. Sometimes for the problem with our work is that we don't always know what to ask. And of course, if we will learn more and we, we will read between the lines, uh, and we, le we will learn more about the protocols that we got and other things that uh, the ministry work on, we will be able to ask for more information. But the fact is that for sure we don't know everything yet and there is a lot uh, to learn more about. Uh, at this time of the corona, as I already mentioned, it's kind of hard in Israel to, no one works or whoever works, works in half, half time or from home and it's hard to get information and some of our efforts, we deal more with things regarding the corona, but at the same time, uh, we are trying to learn more about this ministry. And moreover, of course, because of the fact, <clears throat> sorry, uh, because of the fact that there is a new minister and we do know that they are, they will probably, I don't know if we know, but they will probably change the way uh, the ministry act. So there is a lot to learn uh, in the next few months and years, of course, uh, you can never know uh, how long uh, this uh, government will last and I'm not sure it will be too long. Um, and moreover, uh, one second, sorry. And there are things that we do know that do, we do know that we want to ask and to learn about. Uh, firstly, uh, we get we got information about how much money they spent. And in Israel, uh, government uh, governmental ministries has to publish their pr procurement lists, but at the same time, they don't have to publish the procurements that. Uh, are sealed, like uh, they don't say it because they don't give us that information because of different reasons as security and etc. So we wish to know how much money we don't know about that was spent or other things like uh, the list of the organizations as Noah mentioned uh, that haven't, that got, in, that got money from them and will get money in the future and other issues as uh, Noah also wrote about it, uh, I guess it was two years ago about regarding the blacklist, uh, the organizations that uh, this office wrote as a blacklist that can't come into Israel and we wish to learn more about it. Uh, we do believe that uh, the Israeli citizens and not only in Israel, uh, people has, have the right to learn about what this office do and this ministry do and uh, I don't really know what will be the next uh, big story. I hope uh, maybe Noah and uh, Itamar knows more than me about secrets about, of this office. Uh, although it's really interesting, I'm not there yet, or I won't be there. Uh, but we are here to help in those issues and <laughs> to try get more information, of course. And uh, we will work hardly uh, to get it, of course. Great. Um, back to Itamar, getting back on the screen as he said, there you are. Sure. So. Um, sort of digging a little bit deeper, and can you talk about, and this is something there's a lot of discussion about on the U.S. side, can you talk about the way the ministry, at least in the past, but I think still presently with some of the work it's doing, um, has tried to uh, recruit the Israeli public, and to some extent the international community, um, as a vessel for its international efforts, its online efforts. And can you point maybe to any specific online covert propaganda that has been sponsored by them? And I want to add to that something I, that, that's in the Q&A box. If there is anything you can talk about in terms of their fundraising efforts that you know about how they were targeting in the U.S. or who they were targeting in the U.S. in these largely, you said, failed uh, fundraising efforts. Okay. So I'll first answer uh, the, the last question. Uh, we almost uh, don't know anything about it uh, because it happens uh, abroad and nobody uh, gives us any information about it and we didn't get, didn't get any tips about it. So if you got any tips about the fundraising of the Ministry of Strategic Affairs or Kela Shlomo, please contact <laughs> me and Noah, of course, if you want. Um, but for, for the other answer, for the other question that, uh, that you had, uh, I'll have to split the answer for uh, two pieces. Uh, sure and hardly, uh, the basic strategy of uh, the Ministry of Strategic Affairs uh, was to spread propaganda through organizations and people that are not affiliated with the Israeli government. In that way, they knew 
uh, people all around the world will be more open uh, to listen and be uh, and get get the message done. Uh, we already we already mentioned that the NGOs uh, they got the funding uh, or instructions through Kela Shlomo or or directly through the ministry, uh, but there is also the civilian front. Uh, trying to recruit actual people without payment uh, and sometimes without even telling them directly that they take part in a government mission. Uh, in order to do that, uh, the Ministry of Strategic Affairs started buying news coverage uh, in the Israeli media. Uh, for example, in Yediot uh, Achronot, which is our uh, biggest newspaper, Ynet, which is its uh, online platform, uh, Keshe TV on channel two, that was our, uh, our uh, biggest channel and most successful channel. Uh, and also on the Jerusalem Post, uh, the Times of Israel, Makor Rishon and more. They paid in total something like uh, 7 million shekels, which is a very nice sum uh, of money. Not a Aretz, I have to say, unfortunately. We didn't get the money. They did pay to Aretz? That's what you said, or they didn't? No, they didn't, unfortunately. No. Okay. We need money, you say. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we, we really, we didn't uh, find any information about buying uh, coverage in the Aretz, so uh, Noah's right. Uh, but we did uh, ask about it. Uh, so the general idea was to get Israelis uh, to go online and start uh, doing Asbara on their own or on uh, platforms like uh, ActiL, which is a, an, a cellular application that tells people to comment on articles or on Facebook posts or share or report on, on social media in order to, uh, to certain kinds of people and organizations to get blocked. Uh, and this is what they did, and they used the media in order to recruit the, pe the people of Israel. I don't thi think it went very well, because you didn't see a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, discourse that, uh, that looks like a government uh, orchestrated effort. But I know that ACTAIL, they had, uh, they had some uh, good months and they did, uh, they did a lot. We also, um, do you know this, uh, this application, ACTAIL? Yes, it's an application that is run from a basement in the multidisciplinary uh, center of studies in Erzelia. Uh, and uh, after we wrote about them uh, a few articles, they invited us and, uh, and let us in and answered a lot of questions really openly. That was a really, really something uh, refreshing after trying to get information from the Ministry of Strategic Affairs. And they, their message was that uh, they are working in coordination with the Ministry of Strategic Affairs and the IDF uh, spokesperson and even the Shin Bet, but they do not get uh, money from the government. Later, we found out that they did get some money uh, from the government uh, and that's it. Can I, just a question that I see in the question box, is there any connection that you have found um, beyond suspicion to uh, working with or support for um, NGO Monitor? Um, this comes uh, up in literally every meeting I have in Europe, I'm asked this by Europeans. There was, there was a really um, creative. creative maneuver of a, of transferring funds to organizations uh, a year, uh, I think uh, four months ago with the Genesis Prize. Uh, the Ministry of Strategic Affairs uh, and also uh, Robert Kraft from, uh, from the US that you probably know, I think, what's the name of his uh, football, uh, football club? The Dodgers or something like that. I don't know, we, we don't follow football in Israel. Uh, he gave uh, a, a really nice sum. I think it was a million shekels, and the ministry also put some put some money and also Kela Shlomo for a special prize that was uh, split between around uh, twenty organizations. That a lot of them are organizations that work with the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, and uh, if I remember right, NGO Monitor was one of them, and uh, this we reported. Uh, a few months ago. Great. And, and Robert Kraft owns the New England Patriots. Oh, um, thanks. Wrong <laughs> sport with the Dodgers. 
Um, and Mr. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, so Noah, uh, you're, you're, you, you guys are experts on so many things. We don't expect you to be experts on U.S. football. Um, Noah, can you talk a little bit about what the reaction has been or the maybe non-reaction to the reporting on the Ministry of Strategic Affairs? In the world that I, in which I exist, of people who watch these things closely, this was blockbuster reporting. Um, does anyone care? Does it make any difference? For Israeli. I want to say I want to say no, uh, but I will say something. Uh, I will elaborate. Um, I think Israelis do care about the fact that there are uh, a bunch of ministries that spend their money for unknown reasons, and more so, I think, during COVID nineteen. Uh, the fact that the, this recent government, you know, set a record in the number of uh, ministries that. It, just absolutely no purpose. I think that Israelis do care about. Um, they do, I do see a lot of reactions uh, around our reporting that focus on this uh, issue of uh, this ministry that no one needs, that no one knows what it does, and could have just been a department in another ministry. Um, you know, the um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs has been suffering from a lot of uh, budget cuts for political reasons, and many believe that uh, this could just be, you know, a department at the uh, Foreign Affairs Ministry. So, yes, I think people do care that there's a ministry that does something that no one understands and just spends their money uh, for no good uh, reason. I think ma many do think so. But um, I do not think that there's a real um, discussion uh, on the actual purpose and um, the actual agenda uh, uh, behind this money that they're spending and people are upset about because it's not only about the fact that this is a ministry that was born in sin and no one needs and etc. It, and it's true, by the way, all the reports uh, and all, you know, um, uh, the, the different re reports that were done on the issue uh, uh, say that, you know, this ministry could have been just a department somewhere else, but it's what they're doing that I'm not sure that Israelis care about. Um, I think that um, the policy itself, um, the fight against BDS or, uh, you know, how, however it's, you know, it's called by many names, um, for, for, I think many Israelis bought the basic narrative, um, which is that uh, Israel should fight um, those uh, organizations or activists that um, um, criticize uh, Israel, and they bought into the narrative that all of them uh, are basically a threat to Israel's existence and to the Zionist project as a whole. Um, so I don't think many really care about uh, that, you know, the essence of this policy, what it means, uh, what B BDS actually is. Is it a threat? Is it not a threat? Um, is it, you know, the question of uh, freedom of speech and its limits? I mean, is uh, up to what point do you claim that um, criticism against Israel is legitimate or not legitimate? Um, so um, I think that the uh, public criticism, and sometimes, you know, I can, I can also, also uh, uh, be critical uh, towards uh, us as journalists. It's easier sometimes, you know, to talk about that issue than to talk about uh, the actual uh, the actual policies. It's easier, you know, to talk about the spending, the money, the budgets, the fact that you know they do ridiculous project that no one needs, than to try and con talk about w w what it actually means. Uh, is BDS an enemy that Israel should fight online? Uh, is uh, BDS really involved uh, with terrorism. We see the reports, and by the way, you were asking about the connections between NGO Monitor and the ministry. I think that um, even though uh, I don't have a lot to say about, you know, actual budget, that, you know, I, I didn't see any proof, you know, for, uh, that there are uh, budgets uh, moving uh, between those two organizations, but we do see that the content uh, is similar. 
So, for example, uh, all those reports about the connections between BDS organizations and terrorism, uh, this is, you know, those reports you can see on NGO monitors websites as well. Sometimes I feel like, you know, they're copy pasting uh, a lot of the stuff. I once even asked, I mean, there was one specific report that I really, I was really suspicious that they actually did copy paste it. Uh, and when I asked the ministry it was uh, uh, under Gilad Erdan, uh, they told me that they repackaged it. That it's true that they were working on the same issue, but it's repackaged uh, in different languages. So there's definitely a content, uh, uh, there's a content connection here beyond this whole question that we've been talking about, you know, uh, around money. I mean, uh, a Gongo, a government NGO, it's not only when uh, the NGO receives money, it's also if they represent 100%, you know, the government's uh, uh, stand uh, uh, on everything uh, worldwide. Um, and I think this is, this is definitely the case with NGO Monitor. They represent uh, the Israeli uh, official government policy uh, on many issues. So this unfortunately is something that I think uh, Israelis care less about, not to say that they actually agree with the policy. So I, I would just add, and I, I think that was a really good point you made about NGO Monitor. I mean, there is something of an, I would call it an ecosystem of organizations out there that in substance are all, there's a, it, they create sort of an echo chamber. They, they produce things and they echo them back and forth and it, it's an enormously effective um, ecosystem. So we're going to get, this is our last round. I'm trying to figure in a few questions from the audience here. Um, and I'm going to limit some questions because you guys have covered them. So Noah, I want to both look forward and backwards. Can you talk a little bit about Gilad Erdan in particular? Because now that he's gone from the ministry, so some people would say, okay, that's great news because it means the ministry may go a different direction, but he's in a very powerful position uh, as the ambassador to both Washington and to the UN. And, and can maybe you speculate on what agenda he's bringing there. If he had an agenda coming into the ministry, he now has an agenda coming to Washington and we can see it based on what he's done. Um, and to the extent that you're comfortable, you've mentioned previously, there's a new minister of strategic affairs who is refocusing on the online delegitimization, anti-Semitism. Um, I think a lot of us, I'm speaking as an observer from the US, are extremely worried um, that this is just a new way of framing the same old thing, and in particular, a way of using the battle over the correct definition of anti-Semitism as a way of quashing free speech on social media, which appears to be the big uh, target now. So if you could address uh, either or both of those things and any final things you want to say. So um, maybe we'll start with it. Uh, no, I'll say this. Uh, on Gilad Erdan, um, he's a good politician uh, who uh, wanted uh, more budgets and more influence in the government. Thus, he started this whole, uh, this whole affair. And um, I think that uh, I'm not sure it was that much his agenda or ideology, or I think he mostly uh, wanted to fill with content this, uh, you know, extra ministry he got uh, in addition to police. And I think um, he also on the personal level uh, wanted something that had to do with more of um, the international relations arena. I think that he as a politician understood that uh, in order, you know, what they all want is to be prime minister one day. And I think he understood that he needs something that will put them on the stage on the, like Itamal said, Jerusalem Post conference, speaking about in English, about something that has, uh, that smells like diplomacy. Okay, so uh, that was a good issue for that. Um, that, you know, he could, he made all these like different, and this is also why I think they spend so much money on media in the end. It's not only because they wanted to convince Israelis, because Israelis already bought into that theory that, you know, the biggest devil is the BDS. Uh, it was to put Gilad Erdan on the stage so he could say all these things in English. Um, and I think that worked, you know, pretty well for him. Uh, I think when the new minister, Orit Falkash, got the ministry, uh, I'm pretty sure she had no idea what, you know, why her and why, what is she going to do with it. 
And I think she also probably understood that it's a PR problem uh, for her, this ministry, uh, which I assume is part of the reason that the, ex, the former spokesperson for the uh, IDF uh, is uh, her director general, because um, um, I think his expertise is also, you know, somehow to tackle this uh, PR problem that the, the ministry is kind of... Uh, um, Kind of entangled with. So um, I do see that there are a lot of efforts to kind of uh, uh, rebrand this, as you said. Uh, in the end, it's still the same mission because that was the cabinet's decision. That's the main purpose of the ministry since 2015 to fight the BDS. Uh, but they are trying to somehow give it a more um, a, a more mellow package, uh, uh, such as you know, fighting fight, fighting anti-Semitism, uh, uh, anti-Semitism anti -Semitism online, uh, is a great cause, you know, that no one can argue with. Um, and this is why, by the way, there are now two ministers that are fighting for uh, uh, the same uh, uh, the same content. There's Omer Yankelevich uh, from the Diaspora Ministry and Oid Falkas from the Strategic Affairs Ministry. And they're both kind of tackling the same issue right now, trying to brand themselves as the ones who are fighting uh, hate speech against Jews online. Um, it's very popular also today, you know, to uh, confront social media uh, organizations and so on. So. Uh, I don't know which one of them will win, but that's the direction that both of them uh, chose. Just today, Owit Falkash was in a democracy conference that the New York Times in Athens, uh, speaking about um, fighting uh, hate speech against Jews online. So it's definitely something that they try to emphasize. Does it mean that they are not funding all these other organizations that we don't know about doing other stuff? No. Um, it could definitely be the case while they're trying to emphasize publicly something else. Uh, I do not think, uh, but maybe I'll, I'll be happy to be wrong, that there has been any serious, uh, deep discussion about how to rethink about uh, the definition of this fight and where do you draw the lines in terms of uh, freedom of speech versus something that the government actually needs to fight. Uh, I'm not sure they've done all these, you know, uh, deep processes, uh, but also like, I don't know if you can all, all said before, I don't know how much this government is going to last anyways, and everyone's now obsessed with COVID, and, you know, that's the number one mission for the government anyways. Um, I will mention um, as a final remark, that uh, they issued uh, a whole report today about uh, the fact that um, the, the effects of COVID-19 on uh, philanthropy in this field in general, and they painted a pretty gloomy picture. They hired Deloitte uh, to do this report. Um, I mean, the bottom line is, not surprisingly, the organizations will need more money because it's hard to raise money during COVID. For that, you don't really need Deloitte, but you know, that's how it works in government. Um, so um, I do think there is, there will be a crisis regarding um, if, how, and how much to fund organizations during this pandemic. I'm not sure Israelis will be very, you know, happy to hear that the government will increase the funding to those uh, organizations that no one knows what they do exactly online um, when, you know, the pandemic is, is causing so much, you know, uh, uh, other kinds of troubles for, for the public. You know, people are unemployed, they're demonstrating in the streets. Uh, there are uh, other things that I think will be more urgent. So it will be interesting also to see um, will they actually, what will happen with the next budget, if we will ever have a budget, because that's also a problem, uh, how much this ministry will actually get uh, in the next budget. Fantastic. Um, and I am taking the power of the chair to extend this uh, for the length of at least our last, our, the, the other two participants speaking. So um, if the audience, I hope the audience is interested enough to stay on because I could, I wish we could do this for another hour. Um, but we're not, 15 more minutes. So it's Tamar, this is your, 
if you could answer this question, any final comments you want to make. Um, in 2018, you wrote about the Ministry of Strategic Affairs. It was an article, it was in Hebrew, um, entitled, The American Money Behind the Mass Consciousness Activities of the Israeli Government. So you're speaking be before what is, I think, largely an American audience on this, on this call. So can you talk about that specific title, that specific issue, and the American money factor in the ministry's efforts in the Gilad Erdan era? And can you speculate about what kind of factor you expect this to be going forward as we efforts pivots in the ministry from explicitly focusing on BDS to focusing now on delegitimization and the um, alleged fight against anti-Semitism? Okay, I'll answer about the money question. Uh, it's a hard question. Uh, we did expose that uh, Kela Shlomo got millions from two American funds, uh, the Central Fund of Israel and the uh, One Israel Fund, but that's all we know about the origin of this uh, money. They got around uh, 10, 10 million shekels uh, that we know of. These funds do not disclose uh, the names of, of people or organizations that use them as a money, money pipe. Uh, and Kela Shlomo and the MSA refuse to say who is, uh, who's the billionaire or the organizations that uh, pay the, the money. Uh, since the whole Kela Shlomo project is uh, political, we can speculate that the money sources are in some way uh, related to the political sphere, but maybe not. Uh, the fact is that even, uh, even though the new minister, uh, Farkash Cohen is indeed a lot more open that, than uh, Erdan, there is still a lot more to uncover. Now, there is another question that you asked me before and I forgot to answer. Uh, it's about the, the online uh, civilian propaganda that is orchestrated uh, by the Ministry of Strategic Affairs. Um, that's also very difficult to point out a specific propaganda that was published uh, as an effort of the Ministry of Strategic Affairs. Uh, when we examine their documents uh, and money trail, we've noticed that almost every contract that they got with an NGO had a column saying that uh, regarding social media uh, to promote government uh, messages. Uh, this content is in no way marked as uh, government-sponsored propaganda. We've asked the NSA, uh, the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, to get copies of this uh, online activity, but they declined again and again. We did manage to find some evidence uh, on our own. For example, uh, there's a Facebook page uh, that is called the Israel Under Fire, and the Ministry of Strategic Affairs paid uh, for content that is connected to this Facebook page. But most of the actual propaganda that uh, people and organizations did in behalf of the Ministry of Strategic Affairs is still in the shadows. And uh, we hope that one day we'll be able to get uh, a huge cache of, uh, of print screens uh, that show everything. I would say that all of us on this call, probably most of us on this call, hope you get that as well. Um, okay, so moving to Orr for the last, uh, you get the last word, Orr. Um, so I wanna go back to something that we talked about earlier, which is the argument that's given by the ministry that the release of this information is necessary because of Israeli security considerations. And I want you to talk a little bit from the perspective of a professional who's engaged on freedom of information um, requests of how, how, you, how you reckon with that. This question of whether there is a security element that is real and how much of it is political and, and, and how you unpack that when you're asking for information um, and, and, and justify what you're asking for. Do you mean regarding the Ministry of Strategic Affairs or as a whole? I would say as a whole, but yeah, the Ministry of Strategic Affairs as an example, for sure. So, because I think it's really different in those cases, because first of all, I think regarding to um, the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, the easiest way is to look at the IDF, because a few years ago, the IDF, uh, actually, Ronan Menalis, who is the director of the Ministry of Strategic Affairs today, was the spokesman uh, of uh, IDF. At the same time, he was responsible for freedom of information there. <clears throat> Your representative, I don't know how to say it exactly. 
And I think he knew exactly how to work with those kind of issues. Of course, and I think we will all agree, uh, everyone, almost everyone will agree that some things can't be published. Some issues can't be published if it's regarding a real uh, security issues uh, about, I don't know about, about, it's more complicated than I can uh, say. But uh, I, I think that if there is something uh, that's supposed to be not published, uh, I will agree with it and I will understand it in most of times. And, but unfortunately in Israel, it's kind of hard to know where the limit goes. But if I'm speaking about <clears throat> the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, for sure I haven't conv been convinced yet and Noah spoke about it earlier, if I'm not wrong, uh, about the fact that we haven't been convinced that they deal with social, with national security or anything like it. They have their job, they do what they want to do, they have the, uh, the prerogative to work on the things they work on and they have the budget that they have. But it's still not national security and we st I still believe that most of the information can be published to, uh, to, the, to the public. And more, moreover, I think that it will sound like a lesson in a democracy or something like it, but while we speak on, uh, about transparency, it's our human rights. We have the right to get the information. We have the right to know, as I mentioned before, if money uh, is spent more in the West Bank or inside Israel and what the effort that they make, uh, how deep the information will be or how deep they, re 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 they re will reveal, sorry. It's more complicated and in many, if I won't speak about the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, but to Israel as a whole, it is hard because, uh, because some information is almost impossible to get uh, in Israel, not as in the United States, the CIA has, you can file requests to the CIA in Israel, uh, the law does not imply on the Shabak, on the Shin Bet, and you can't get any information. Um, uh, once an organization tried to get information regarding um, a wiretapping, a wire and uh, they tried to get it from uh, the prime minister office, but they said that the information is in the sh Shin Bet, or, although he has to sign the papers, but they don't collect the information, so it's only in the Shin Bet, but they can't know how, much, how many times uh, he gave them the option to put a uh, wire tapping or something like it. I don't remember exactly the case. So it's a big problem in Israel. And I think we haven't succeeded yet to learn enough regarding to security uh, uh, issues. But if we're talking about the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, I think we need to stop think that it's regarding security in this way. It has things to, it, they do somehow important things. I don't know if, if the, it's their work or the Foreign Affairs Office, or I don't mind about that. I want them to be, uh, to be transparent and to give the uh, society, the public of Israel, the people of Israel, the information, and also for you, it doesn't matter for who. Uh, if they do something, they need to be proud of, him, of it. And if they're not proud of it, they have a problem with what they're doing, probably. Thanks. It, it does seem, I'm just gonna say as an observation that the idea of of being unable to release information for security reasons in the Israeli context, and I'm sure it happens in other countries as well, but it seems to sometimes be code for, we don't want to release this because it would be politically awkward or embarrassing. That's and awesome. I would note, you know, as someone who's worked on the settlements file for years, the fact that we can't see the funders of say El Ad, the group that does the settlement projects in East Jerusalem, because those funders are shielded by Israeli law. Whereas every funder of every Israeli NGO that works on settlements is scrutinized and has to be amplified. And there's actually a report in Haaretz, I think a few days ago, because some leaked documents finally shed some light on one of the big funders of the settlers in East Jerusalem. But they were, that person was shielded from transparency by law as they put millions of dollars into a political program. So, all right, well, this was great. I wish we could do this for longer. Um, if I can just add oh, also absolutely. that. Yes, but, yes. Yeah. Um, thank you uh, for this. It was uh, also really fun to do this with Itamar and all. Um, I, from my experience, usually uh, when you hide something, it usually gets worse than if you just publish it. 
I do not understand why authorities all over the world don't understand this basic truth about journalism. If you hide something for us, we're more interested than if you just publish this list somewhere where no one cares about it. So that would just be... You know, those, that. those are words of warning to anyone who is on this webinar from a government ministry from any country. Heads up. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So we'll close with that. So on behalf of the Foundation for Middle East Peace, I want to thank Noah or and Itamar it, it, it for what has been a really terrific webinar. I don't think there's ever been any discussion like this about the ministry before. Uh, thanks everyone for joining and for your questions. If we didn't get to your questions, rest assured we will send a list of all of the questions to all of the participants in the webinar so that they know what you're interested in and can write about it or speak about it another time. Encourage people to follow our participants online, Noah at haaretz.com or on Twitter at Noah underscore Landau. Itimar, follow at the 7i, that's number 7, um, dot org dot il or on Twitter and, and it's at the and number seven and letter small i and to follow or, uh, or at meida m e i d a dot org dot il or on Twitter at um, it's ampersand at shakuf s h a k o o f um, as for the foundation check us out online fmep dot org the video of this uh, webinar will be online soon it's on Facebook Live now. Um, you can also join us if you're interested uh, this Tuesday, October 6th for our next webinar, which is called, Is it Time to Reform International Aid to Palestine? Featuring Palestinian experts and, uh, and, and activists uh, looking at that very timely issue. That will be at 11 o'clock Eastern time as well. So with that, we will close our webinar for today. Thank you so much to our participants and everyone who joined Thank us. You. Thank you. Thank you. It was great being here. Bye-bye.